Lecture 24, Vikings in America. Another of the rich sources for the myths of the Germanic heroic age are the Norse sagas, the sagas of Norway and Sweden and of Iceland, which sing of the age of the Vikings that period between 793 A.D. and 1066, in which the Vikings raided far and wide, carried out savage blood feuds against each other, and then in their long ships terrorized Europe from the Isles of Britain all the way to Constantinople. And in the meantime, Vikings also discovered America. To understand that, I want you to go back with me to the summer of 1960. And we are sailing with Helge Marcus Ingstadt, full worthy to be the son of Vikings. He is a Norwegian, best selling author, hunter, trapper, and anthropologist. He is, his father was a engineer in Norway, uh, and uh, Helge seemed likely to have a fairly humdrum life. He went to law school, graduated, began to practice law in the early 20s, and then just suddenly to the consternation of his family, his friends, he went off to the Northwest Territories of Canada, and for three years lived among the Inuit, the Eskimos as they were once called, uh, learned their language and hunted and trapped, lived off of the resources of the land. When he came back, he wrote in Norwegian, a book that was translated into numerous languages. Uh, in English, it was called Canada, the land of feast or famine. And it was just an exciting adventure tale of a man who went on a quest a man who was determined not to let his destiny be laid out in a humdrum fashion, but to seize, seize the chance at adventure, just like a Jason in the Argonaut. And he continued on. He uh, spent more years in various parts of uh, Canada. He spent uh, some time as governor of the farthest tip of uh, Norway, what we would call part of Lapland. And uh, some of his work as an anthropologist was uh, of enormous importance. He also lived for a while with the Apache Indians in the southwest of the United States. He learned how to use uh, dictating machines to take down the oral traditions in the original language of the Apaches and of the Inuit and other Native American tribes that he lived with. And as in many cases, almost all of the Native American of that tribe who spoke that language as their mother tongue have died off, his collection of these recordings of oral tradition is of enormous interest and plays a crucial role in reestablishing the national ethnicity and identity of some of these tribes. But now, in uh, 1960, he's on another quest. Now, he is already 61 years of age. He will live on to be 101 years of age. He's 61 now, well off because of the sale of his books. And he has decided he is going to find proof that Vikings settled in America, or at least discovered North America. And this was largely looked upon as a crackpot idea. Oh, going back into a well in the 19th century, at various times a local newspaper, generally from some small town, would report that a Viking helmet had been discovered, or a Viking sword, or that there were carvings that were interpreted as the special alphabet of the Vikings, the runes which the Vikings believe had a 
magical significance. Uh, in fact, there is even such a set of Viking runes in Oklahoma. And there are people who believe quite seriously that uh, the Vikings sailed all the way down around Florida, uh, up the Mississippi, explored various tributaries of the Mississippi. Uh, and uh, it certainly wasn't beyond their seamanship. It's just, I think, dubious that these particular uh, artifacts are realistic and historic, authentic. So if in 1960, in the spring semester, a student had gone up to his professor, some pot-bellied professor like me, and said, is it really true that uh, Vikings discovered North America? The professor would say in his most pompous fashion, no, dead wrong. There is no evidence whatsoever. In fact, all the evidence that has been put forward is obviously fraudulent. And the Icelandic sagas, if you can read them in the original the way I can, uh, are largely fabrications. In fact, the Vikings in North America are a superb example of what we've been talking about, like Atlantis. It is a myth without any historical kernel whatsoever. And I want you to remember that and write that on the test. Yes, sir. And off would go the student, quite convinced that Vikings had never been in North America. But Ingstadt thought differently. In fact, he really could read the sagas in the original Icelandic. He thought that they had far more truth than was generally admitted, and that particularly two of them were very matter-of-fact accounts of finding Vineland, or what was North America. This was the Greenlander saga, the Grunlanda saga, and the saga of Eric the Red, Erika Zagaruda. And he thought that they established that somewhere in the northernmost regions of North America, Vikings had landed and settled for a while. Thus, being a superb uh, seaman with his boat, he was making his way up the coast of North America, exploring various inlets and coves or going up rivers that ran into the ocean. And he had finally come by June of 1960 to the very tip of Newfoundland, uh, right where Newfoundland looks over to Labrador. And he pulled his boat into a little fishing village, a little marina there, and got out. And a gentleman walked down to him and stuck out his hand and said, I'm Decker. Who are you? I am Ingstadt. Yes? Where are you from? Norway. Norway? What is it a Norwegian doing in our little fishing village here in Newfoundland? Well, I tell you what I am doing here. I am traveling all along the coast of North America because I believe that, they, that we can find evidence that Vikings settled in North America. Oh, I've heard about that. That's nonsense, isn't it? No, I don't believe it is. Well, what would be evidence that they were here? Well, I think you could find archaeological evidence. Archaeological evidence? What do you mean? Well, I just wonder, and I ask this everywhere I go, and I haven't gotten a good answer yet. Is there anything here in the village or nearby countryside that looks like a, a hill, but a hill that's out of place? Maybe the land is flat like these meadows here, and one or two or three of these are sp rising up. Oh, you're talking about barrels. We're not that ignorant up here. Uh, sure. Uh, this is interesting you ask this. Now, my ancestors founded this little village. What's it called? Lancy Meadows. Oh, I thought from my chart it was Lance O Meadows. Yeah, that's what the French called it, but we couldn't go through all of that, so it's, we call it Lancy Meadows. Okay. Uh, so we've always wondered. Come along with me. Let's walk a little bit. See in this meadow right here, these barrels rising up? I don't think they're hills. Wow. Most interesting. Do you ever find anything? Well, from time to time, somebody does find like a little iron object. Um, I found one, something when I was a boy that looked like a needle. Truly. I'm going to get my wife. And can we buy some shovels and other objects to uh, 
dig with? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's my land you'd be digging on. Uh, I tell you what, you go ahead and dig there. Just don't tell the government about it because they'll get up here and they'll cause all kinds of trouble. All right, all right. And so his wife, Anne, was a trained archaeologist. She and uh, Helge had met through correspondence. She read his books. She was Norwegian. She read his books. She fell in love with him through his books. And uh, they corresponded, then they met and dated, and then he, he was 20 years older than she was, but they married. And she became his helper throughout the rest of, of her life. He would outlive her. He would live on to be 101 years of age, truly worthy of being a hero of a saga. They began to dig. And in the seven years that followed, the seven seasons of archaeological work, so seven summers, they dug. Now this was not a, an attractive place to have an archaeological excavation, unlike digging, for example, at Knossos in Crete under the blue sky. In June, there in uh, Lancy Meadows, the temperature frequently was around 30 degrees. Uh, the summer lasted about seven weeks, but many days you could not excavate because it might even snow in June. And the day he arrived, it had snowed just a few a few days before, and snow was very heavy on the ground. And time and again, these terrible storms would blow down from the north. I mean, between Newfoundland and the Arctic is nothing but tundra and rocks. And these waves would come crashing in. It would rain for days. So it was hard work, hard archaeological work. But of course, being Norwegians, it didn't seem particularly bad to them, I suppose. And in the seven seasons that they dug, they uncovered eight structures that clearly established a Viking settlement. There were houses. One of them had several rooms in it. And there were little shops. There was a blacksmith's shop. There was a place to put the... Uh, workings of the iron that the blacksmith had uh, forged. And there were found a small number of objects. A few needles, uh, objects for weaving cloth, which made it clear that women as well as men had come, since weaving was women's work. Uh, a little stone lamp. Enough to show that, that, that these were very much the same as you would have found 1000 AD in uh, Iceland or Greenland of the Viking settlements, and also to show that they, the evacuation had been peaceful. I mean, they had packed up almost everything and just sailed away. So at Lancy Meadows, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, one of the most exciting archaeological excavations I believe, of the 20th century, done again by an amateur who went where the professor said there's no chance whatsoever of finding any traces of Vikings, just the way the professors had said there's no chance of finding any evidence of Troy. So it's a World Heritage Center. The Canadian uh, archaeologists have continued the work. It is beautifully restored, uh, has even uh, in actors there that dress up like Vikings and show you how they lived. Much of their uh, food came from salmon, for example. Uh, and uh, it's just a real picture of this settlement on the far fringes of the world. So how did the sagas lead Inga Ingstadt there with his wife to excavate? Because as Schliemann believed in the historicity of Homer, so Helga Ingstadt believed in the historicity of these Norse sagas. Now, the Norse sagas are part of the same tradition as, say, Beowulf. They were originally orally composed, sung around the hearth of a Viking war chief. Uh, they are in the Icelandic language. Uh, and originally in Old Norse. 
Icelandic, Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish were once essentially the same language, Old Norse. But uh, D Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian have considerably modernized and changed. The Icelanders, for a long time, largely separated from much of Europe, and then in more recent generations, since they have become independent, on purpose, have kept their language as archaic as possible. Uh, when a new word like, let's say, military term, tank, uh, needs to be added to the Icelandic language, they don't say tank, they make it into the Icelandic word for um, iron dragon. So these sagas preserve stories of blood feuds, and the blood feud was essential to the definition of a Viking man. If someone killed your relative, you not only had to kill that man, but several of his relatives. They, in turn, had to kill you and several of your relatives. Then your son and several of his friends, relatives, had to kill them, and so it went on. And uh, none of these blood feuds was more violent than those carried out by Eric Thorvaldson, or Eric the Red, red-haired and red-handed, bloody. And Eric's father, Thorvald, was also an outlaw. He had gotten into a blood feud that had become finally so serious that he was exiled from Norway by King Harold the Fair and went to Iceland. And Iceland had been settled by Vikings as early as 874. And these Vikings uh, loved war, they loved raiding, but they also farmed, uh, carried out trade and commerce. That's what finally took them to Russia and down the rivers of Russia all the way to Constantinople. And uh, the Scandinavian homeland, like Norway, has very little good land and thus people were attracted to Iceland as early as 874. And there they established what was perhaps the earliest in Europe, and still continuing in Europe, a democratic assembly. It was called the thing. Same way that in uh, Latin, res publica means the public thing. This was the thing of the Icelanders. That's where the laws were made, every free Icelander having his chance to speak. And that was also the high court. So uh, uh, Thorvald made his way to Iceland, and his son was born to him, Eric. And Eric inherited his father's really hot temper. He had already gotten into a serious blood feud that was brought before the thing, but finally the thing had managed to uh, negotiate and adjudicate it. And then Eric got into, a trouble, got into trouble because he loaned something to a neighbor. Eric had quite a large farm uh, there in Iceland, and his nearby neighbor was Thorgest. You can see they're still devoted to their Norse gods, like Thor, the god of thunder. So Thorgest uh, was the neighbor, and Eric had a special set of roof beams that had may, may have been handed down through the family. And this is not something you would go and buy at the local lumber yard. These were ornate, beautifully decorated with paint and some precious stones, and he loaned it to his neighbor. Then went back and said, can I have my beams back? And the neighbor said, I don't know what you're talking about. So Eric killed him and killed several of his relatives. And this time, well, this is your second time you were out. And so the thing in uh, 982 sentenced Eric to three years of exile. Well, he went off to west, just sailing out on a quest. And there he discovered a large island, most of it glaciers and icebergs. But as he sailed on around to the southern coast, he found two inlets. It was green. There were meadows that would produce crops. So he became a real estate salesman and went back to uh, Iceland and put out advertisements that there was land to be held in Greenland. Well, he said, that sounds a lot better than Iceland. I don't know how you sell any land here. So settlers went to Greenland, and um, uh, uh, Eric had a large farm there, and they had a nice family, like his son Life, Life the Lucky. 
And sometime around probably 990, one of the local merchants, Bjarni Haraldson, Her Her uh, was sailing back and forth between Norway, Iceland, and Greenland. And his father had moved to Greenland, and uh, Bjarni liked to spend one season with his father in Greenland and then one season back in Norway, and he had become fairly prosperous at this. So he was sailing from Norway to his father's home in Greenland and was blown off course. Now, the Vikings were remarkable seamen, and their ships are some of the most amazing ships ever created. They're long ships, up to 95 feet long, able to pull into a river with no more than one meter of water. And then they're merchant ships, able to carry 24 tons. They sailed largely through an instrument they had that could enable them to determine latitude. And they had an elaborate set of nautical guides that told them at which latitude and at what time the sun rose and set on each day. They may have had a compass, though that's debated. And so, as long as they had the latitude, they could say, oh, well, Bjarni fell into a fog, got lost, came back, and when the fog lifted, he had blown far to the west, and his men with him said, look at that land over there, look at all that timber, let's go cut it. Bjarni said, no, I want to go home and see my dad. So he went home. But he told people what he had seen, and life, Eric, Erickson said, uh, Eric's uh, son said, well, he should have gone in there. That might be a great economic opportunity because the Vikings loved, above all, making money. So Life asked his father to join him, and his father agreed, but as he was about to go down to the ship to sail off, his horse slipped, and Eric fell and said, this is not meant for me. So Life sailed off, and they came, and they sailed west and west and west, and they came first to a land with flat rocks, Helleland, perhaps Baffin Island, almost certainly, then Markland, that was getting on further down the coast of Labrador. And we can still see today the white sandy beaches described by Life Erickson. And then they came to Vinland. They pulled into a cove and found the rivers filled with salmon, lots of game like moose. And for two days, the foster father, Turker was, was his name, of Life Erickson, the man who had taught him how to be a sailor, was missing. And finally they found him, and he was originally from Germany, and he was so drunk he was speaking German. And they said, how did you get drunk and please speak Norse so we can understand you? He said, this place is full of berries, grapes, I've made wine. You can't make wine. Look, I come from Germany, I know what grapes look like. And sure enough, it was Vinland, the land of the vines. Well, they wintered over there, spent the winter there, and then sailed back with a large cargo of lumber, always in big demand in Greenland. And after having wintered there for that year, life went back and his brother Thorvald said, I'll lead an expedition. So Thorvald, also the son of Eric, sailed over, taking with him several ships, and life during his winter there had built this settlement of these eight buildings. It was called Life's Spooder, Life's little place. And uh, they, Thorvald and his men settled there. And one day they were exploring. And it may well be that they used this base to sail further down because it is described how they came finally to a place where um, in the winter, because they wintered over there as well, spent the winter there is what I'm saying, where even on the shortest day of the year, the sun was up by nine o'clock in the morning and didn't set until three. So maybe as far as the, almost the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so they wintered there, and then one day as they were exploring, they saw these strange looking vessels, we know them to be canoes, 
and three people sleeping under each of them. Well, what would a Viking do? He would naturally kill them. And that is what they did. They did. They killed eight of them. But one of them fled and brought back a large number of his fellow Native Americans, probably Micmacs, speaking an Algonquin language. And they and the Vikings got into a real serious battle. Vikings built a barricade, but the Skralings, that's what the Vikings called the Native Americans. I mean, this is just what it meant. It meant the wretched ones. One of them shot an arrow that pierced Thorvald, and he died. So his comrades sailed back. His body was left there. And the next year, his brother. By now, we're down to around 10106. And then that year, his brother Thorstein sailed back to Vinland. But he didn't make it. He was blown off course, and Thorvald's body still lay there, unclaimed. Then the sister, Freyda. Now, she was just as fierce and wild as her brothers, and as fierce and wild as her uh, father. She was Freyda Eriks daughter. She decided she would get together an expedition. And she sailed along with uh, two men that she had convinced to go partners with her, Helgi and Finbogi. And they were going to make a long-standing settlement. There had already been, on one of the earlier voyages, uh, a child born there, Snorri, the son of Thorfinn and Gudrid. And that Snorri is probably the first Caucasian born in North America, little Snorri. But Freyda was going to go with Helgi and Finbogi. And these stories are in the Greenland saga and the saga of Eric the Red. And she promised them they would go half on everything. She would go with her husband, Thorvard, and they would trade with the Skralings. And an earlier expedition had been successful at trading with the Skralings, not trading them north. Norse weapons, but trading them other objects and goods, including they, the Norsemen could carry cows with them in their merchant ships, and the Skralings, the Native Americans, loved milk. So Freyda, her husband Thorvard, Helga, Finbogi, five women, and a number of other men sailed on this last, what would turn out to be the last expedition around 1010. And they arrived there in the land of Vinland, and began to make some real money by trading with the Skralings. And uh, came time late in the spring and to divvy it all up after they had spent the winter. And Freyda said, uh, you boys, Helga and Finbogi, you get only a tiny portion. And they said, no, we're going halves. You can't cheat us. Well, Freyda went back. She had met with them at night, got in bed with her husband, kicked him out of bed, Thorvard, and said, you're utterly worthless. I was just assaulted by Helgi and Finbogi. I don't believe that. You don't think somebody wants to assault me? I don't know, but I mean, I don't believe they would. Well, they did. You got to go kill them. If you don't kill them, I will. So she went, and Thorvard, they were, Helgi and Finbogi were killed, but Thorvard said, what about these five women? I'll kill them if you don't have the guts for it. And so she did. Ah. Uh, they were attacked by the Skralings, and Thorvard ran away. Well, Freyda stood right there, ripped open her dress, showed her bosoms, beat her bosom with her sword, and then went after those Skralings. And they were terrified. They ran away. So, but that was the last time the Vikings would go, and life's Buddha would remain uninhabited until another Norse hero found it. You might one time ponder, though, the what-ifs of history. What if an enduring settlement had been established there? How would the history of North America have been different? Or another what-if. Because clearly, the Vikings did not come back because the Skralings were so ferocious and numerous. By the time Jamestown was established, Terrible epidemics of disease had decimated the population of the Native Americans, brought by European fishermen, 
from the time of Columbus onward. And the population of the Native Americans all along the Atlantic seaboard had been greatly diminished. What if those plagues had not come? And when the Englishmen had landed at Jamestown, they had been attacked and killed and killed and killed by the Skralings, by the Native Americans. On such things, history hangs.